actually gonna it is little regionals that we're doing right yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, i don't want to mess it up right. that's where i'm flying to so i hope it is <laughs> hopefully <Yeah>. hopefully <laughs> Welcome here to the Shuffle Squad one more time. We're going to be talking about the next upcoming regionals on this Meta Forecast show that we do all the time here on the Shuffle Squad. We want to prepare you for all the upcoming events, whether it's a major event or if you're just at home playing in Challenges Cups or hopefully you're playing in that late night on PTCG Live after this update. You don't have to restart for friends anymore. Bless up. Uh, we got there. Uh, we finally did it. But if not, Hopefully you're learning a little bit about the competitive side of Pokemon, the trading card game. And that's what we're all about. We've got a lovely panel of guests here for our Lil Regionals coming up over in France. We're very excited to be showcasing another European regional. We have some uh, guests from over on the other side of the pond, if you will. And we are going to go through everybody that's joining us here on the show. So our first guest that has not been here before, uh, better known as Sharni online. Arnie, uh, you're joining us here. Where should the people know you from? All right. So I'm Arnie Karjala. I live in Helsinki, Finland, and I started playing Pokemon in 2017. And I've been playing so seven years now. And I, I just aged up to the Master Division uh, in the last season. So this is like my second season playing in the Master's Division. And I have been doing pretty good in Seniors and also in Masters. I got a top 8 finish in Dortmund Regionals last year and also a top 16 in the last Lille Regionals, which is we are coming back to Lille. So. Very, very cool. And a, a guest joining us again uh, on here, we have Christian joining us. Christian, where should the people know you from? Yep. Uh, hi, I'm Christian Fontenot. Uh, you may or may not have heard of me. I go by Sticks Online. Uh, I stream on Twitch um, very actively, three to four times a week. Uh, I meme on Twitter uh, or X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I have really bad opinions. Um, <laughs> uh, I played Reggie's for a while. Uh, I was pretty famous for that. Uh, and then I also won the Stuttgart Regional Championships. Uh, last season, I've uh, been playing since 2016, about eight and a half years now. Um, so yeah, I'm um, experienced mostly, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, really just uh, excited to come on here and uh, talk some Pokemon. Yeah, regional winner over here uh, in, our, in our presence here. Uh, and last but not least, just because it's on the alphabetical scale, if you're watching this video, you should know who our last guest is. Uh, we have Zach joining us here. Zach, where should the people know you from? Um, I mean, people can know me for a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> most recently I made top 16 at Lima, uh, especially yeah. then, about a couple of weeks ago. Um, okay. I was actually talking to Diego Casaraga there. Uh, I think we deemed ourselves as uh, top three Pokedads in the game. We just wel I welcomed a newborn um, about a month ago into the world. So uh, if anyone's wondering who, uh, it's between me, Diego, and uh, Alessandro Cremasoli. If there's any other Pokedads out there. Better be supporting those kids, bro, because I don't know about y'all. Anyways, um, yeah, no, so I'm super excited to kind of go over uh, definitely playing in a uh, Stellar Crown regionals already, or especially event already. I have a lot of uh, input on the metagame, and um, yeah. yeah, super excited to kind of get into things today. Yeah, absolutely, and so are we. I know a lot of things did happen over the course of Louisville uh, this past weekend, so we're going to kind of talk about that, and actually we're going to start with you, Zach, here. I want to get your input because you have a really good feel for the competitive aspect of Pokemon TCG, and I, I really want your input because we saw so many players compete in this event, but not enough to get us a ninth round in day one. And what we're going to talk about on the show here today is really this new structure and how it's affecting not only what we're playing for an event, but also what the mindset should be going into these bigger events here. So we noticed that there's only eight rounds in Louisville, and we're potentially going to see that maybe in Lille if we're going to have a lower attendance amount. So only eight rounds, and then if you did go undefeated on the second day didn't necessarily make the top eight because it was a clean cut so what are your thoughts on the x2 records of day one not necessarily making it into uh top cut um if this was an after hours episode <laughs> i'd say something different than scuffed um uh, i think that uh going x2 at any events and i mean any major event should probably get you into top eight and when i say probably i'm on the fence like i think if you advance to day two um, under Pokemon's current structure, we have the kind of thought or the understanding that if you go undefeated, you have a chance to make top eights. 
Um, knowing that half the competitors were there playing for boxes or um, additional cast pricing, like things that are fantastic. Like, don't get me wrong. I think the other argument is people are like, these top players are so entitled and privileged that they're upset that they won a thousand dollars. I don't think that's the case. We're talking about a world where um, many players are making their livelihood off of this game. Um, many players are fulfilling kind of a legacy of Pokemon. Whereas um, if we take Alex Shemansky, one of our Shuffle Squad members, Alex went 6-2, not the greatest record to make day two, but enough to make the day two threshold that Pokemon set themselves. Much more difficult than last year, um, because if it was the same as last year, it'd be 5-2-1 if we were doing it by the right amount of rounds that we had eight. So Alex met the expectations, went undefeated. And when I'm saying undefeated, it's not like Alex had two ties, two wins, won four rounds, and then there wasn't an asymmetrical top cut because of some other things that happened in the tournament. Now, I think that that part's frustrating that I guess they didn't foresee that happening. Or maybe in this case, we can hope that it's a rare occurrence of it happening based off of being very close to that ninth round triggering. And then other events that happen, maybe with the tie rates, uh, maybe more or less drops, maybe more or less disqualifications, maybe more or less anything that kind of contributed to that asymmetrical cut um, not triggering. Um, because asymmetrical cut for anyone who's watching, because I mean, maybe it's it's still pretty new. Um, asymmetrical cut takes the person with the lowest record and everyone with that record continues on to making top cut. Right. Um, so in this case, Alex and a handful of others, I think it was four other players who went 4-0 day two, did not make top eight or top whatever cut asymmetrical. Um, do I think that it's something that we should immediately write off? No, I don't think it's something that we should immediately write off. I think this might be um, a minor glitch in the system. Not saying that it's a glitch like as it shouldn't have happened. I think that we were at a really awkward amount of players and that might have what that might have what, what triggered it. Um, I hope that if that this trend continues that we end up fixing it. Um, but not to dive too deep into another direction. I think um, also not making top 16 at that event for Alex going X2. I think we actually probably need more rounds of Pokemon overall um, mm -hmm. to try to find um, better results. Right. Um, we're seeing players, uh, I'll personally use myself, I lost my winning into top 8 at Worlds, bubbled out of top 32, walked away with nothing. We're watching players go here, so it's almost an ad an advantage to not be in contention for top eight to get the top 16. Um, in some ways, I think right now we just need deeper prizing at Pokemon uh, to reward those who had successful runs. Not saying that every single person that loses deserves to be rewarded, but right now with the growth of our game and the, the way the structure goes, it can be quite disappointing. Um, on the other hand, to got even smaller tournaments like the Lima special event that I went to, it is quite odd to play eight rounds day one and two rounds day two. Um, so I have to go 6-2. That makes there's 22 of us going into day two. I have to win one to maybe make top 16, maybe yeah. win and tie to make top asymmetrical cuts. Um, overall, there's definitely some problems with the system. So if anyone out here at Pokemon uh, is listening, I'm totally down for a chat if you have any suggestions. I've been playing Pokemon for over 20 years. And um, one of those things where something's not right, it's almost right there. We're almost good. I mean, as much as I want to play more Pokemon, I'm sometimes okay playing less Pokemon. I think everyone kind of has that feeling. Uh, I don't want to play less Pokemon when it robs players of opportunities, and I'm always going to be a person for the players. Absolutely. And I know that if you're just watching it as a, a newer player or a uh, newly casual competitive player... A lot of that didn't necessarily make sense because we're diving deep into how this tournament structure breaks down. But I want to get your perspective, Christian, on this because you're, you know, you're also a content creator. You do stream. A lot of your audience is casually competitive, learning how to play the game, kind of bare bones. So what does it mean for somebody that's coming in as a casual competitor? Is it something that you kind of chalk it up as Pokemon's learning? So if you want to come play these big events... It's just a learning experience for that type of player also, or I guess I'll, I want to get your hot takes on this. Yeah. So uh, firstly, um, 
I won't repeat everything Zach said, but I do agree with basically all of it. Um, not even basically, just actually straight up all of it. Uh, a lot of really good points made from both perspectives as well. Um, honestly, to just like quickly go back to that, um, I will say that I think structure-wise, there should never be a possibility that you can go XO in day two and not uh, make top cut. Right, I don't think that should ever be possible. If that means we add an extra round and you have to go five zero, sure, I have no, I have no issue with that. But um, the structure should never be set up in a way where that's even possible, um, because it means that for the majority of players, assuming you're going into the tournament with expect with the expectation to win, um, you go in at six two and there's just no point, right? Obviously, again, you know, there's plenty of things to, to play for, right? But it's just it's really demoralizing as a competitor especially at the higher level um as well as i really think the issue is that the bubble is so big and this does kind of wrap into how it affects the player base as a whole right because uh, i encourage everyone who is newer to the game going to the first couple of regionals right to use those first couple of regionals as a learning experience right uh the you know very few people are going to pop off and do super super well at the first event right learning how to play a major is just as much of a skill as learning how to play the game of Pokemon, exactly. right? Playing eight to nine rounds, right? Playing the same deck for eight to nine rounds, knowing how to conserve your mental stamina, how to wake up the next morning for day two, right? right. Um, that in and of itself is a skill you have to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so I encourage people to do that. And for those players who are new to the game, this won't really affect them. You might have that one less round in day one, but... Sure. It's whatever, right? Okay. If anything, the fact that booster packs go further down is actually a net positive. Exactly. Um, with that in mind, if you go on a really deep run at your first, first, second, maybe third tournament, right? You're really excited. You're really, really happy, right? Uh, I remember my own first day two uh, in Masters was the Indianapolis Regional Championships in 22. Um, and this was when 1,000 player regionals were considered really big. Right. Like I think Indianapolis was the first or second four digit regional. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but it was it was one of the first ones anyway. Um, I want to say the first one of the 2022 season. But regardless, I think I went I went six two one into day two mm -hmm. and then I went three one two in day two. Right. Okay. So an impressive score for your first day two. Sure. Uh, and I remember being really disappointed because I got. Uh, top 64, right? I felt kind of robbed, um, honestly, because, you know, having played in Europe where tournaments at the time were even even smaller, right? Um, I, I literally had friends who made top eight that same weekend in whatever other, you know, tournament was going on um, with my same score, right? And sure, there was one rest round and whatever, right? But it, it kind of made me feel like, well, I, I had a good record in day two, mm -hmm. Um and I, I walked away with half a box. I mean, that's yeah. cool, but I already had my invites. The points didn't matter, right? Um, I can't even imagine what it must feel like to, in the current modern day, make your first day two have a really, really, really good day two fi like finish like by first uh, day two standards. Like, I don't know. Let's say 6-2 into day two, and then you go 3-1. I think that's impressive for anyone of any skill level, right. frankly, right? Um, I'm fairly certain, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm fairly certain that score bubbled out of top 32. It might not even have made it in the first place. Um, and that's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I, I frankly think that's ridiculous. It's honestly, it's even worse if it's a bubble. Um, yeah. because I think bubbles are kind of inevitable to a certain extent. Sure. But the bubbles have gotten so massive. And I want to get back to Sack, uh, to Sack's example here at Worlds. The Worlds bubble was frankly unacceptable. Um, if I can like, you know, if, again, if this was after hours and maybe on my own personal stream, I could use some less family friendly words here, but, uh, we'll keep it family friendly. Uh, I'll let you fill in the gaps, yeah. but, uh, I think it was like what eight people bubbled in and seven people bubbled out of top 32 right. at worlds. We're talking what $5,000 and the top 32 swag, like the top 32 kit. Uh, frankly, I think the top 32 get matters a lot more than the money. Uh, that might just yeah, be me, but uh, I mean, having what, like, especially for Zach, frankly, I think Zach was off the worst um, of anyone else, like in anyone in that situation. Mm -hmm. You lose your, your win into top eight, right? And then you walk away with nothing. I mean, that's ridiculous. Right. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I think I do want to kind of chime yeah. in quick. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. one thing that I do want to point out is my situation is based off the players that I played 
When we say day yeah, yeah. one, people don't understand that day one and day two are the same tournament now. Yes. A continuation, and your tiebreakers from your day one opponents continue on to day two. Um, unfortunately, I knocked out a lot of my opponents starting with a kind of poor record at Worlds. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any opponents that made day two at Worlds. So like, sure, you might consider that an easy run or whatever. Maybe someone went yeah. on a Cinder, whatever, but... I didn't have those extra tiebreakers of players seeing success. All my opponents were dropped from the tournaments, which can yeah. be negative. So throwing that in there, that mm. tiebreakers can affect you deeply based off when you're losing. So if you're losing games, it might sound easy to just be like, don't lose. But yeah. realize that losing earlier on in the tournament is significantly going to impact how your result might go depending on how your opponents um, advance into the tournament. Sorry to cut you off, I'll let you get back in there. Yeah, no, you're totally fine, you're totally fine. I think that's uh, important added context as well. Um, and to a certain extent, the fact that it's that relevant, I think can be discussed as a problem in and of itself, but we have to have some form of tiebreaker. And I think resistance in and of itself isn't a terrible tiebreaker. Um, I just think that you shouldn't be able to be in a position where you are on the winning in to top eight, especially at the World Championships, really any tournament. Um, and then the difference between winning and losing that round is at the bare minimum uh, for Rahul anyway, the ninth place spot, right? Um, going all the way down to then walking away with nothing. Um, and then even like for anyone else, right? Like, you know, you win your presumably winning in for top 32 and then you bubbled, I don't know, like 37th hypothetically, right? Um, it's it's a problem I feel like, to a certain degree, could just be solved with an extra round. I don't think one extra round in day two is going to magically fix all the issues, but I do think at the bare minimum it should make the bubble less, mm -hmm. which to me it sounds like a positive. Of course, having an extra round has its own complications whenever, right? Especially with asymmetrical cut, which I do think asymmetrical cut is a net benefit right i think i think asymmetrical cut is great i love it bubbling out of top eight sucks um and it's arguably like almost like i think it's arguably worse than bubbling out of top 32. um so asymmetrical cut is great but i feel like the system around it isn't set up in a way to make the rest of the tournament feel great um so i don't know what the main solution is i think an extra round is great but um, I don't know what the logistics for that to happen are, but mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that it is a problem. Yeah. Now, kind of bridging the gap here, because we know that Pokemon TCG competitive, at least for the TPCI circuit, is going through some growing pains here because we're trying out a new system. We're seeing what works, what doesn't work. Uh, speaking of growing pains, obviously, Arnie, you are now, age, you know, you've aged up into Masters. So tell me what this means from a perspective of somebody that's looking at these tournaments now and looking what the X2 on day one is equaling and your mindset now going into the Masters division uh, out of seniors. What do you think about that? Be yeah, thank you. So overall, like the first thing is that uh, this like uh, this is in the in the structure. Uh, mm -hmm. The senior structure is also different, like right. compared to the old seasons. Compared to the old, old seasons, we didn't have like day two at seniors. We only only had like maybe seven rounds in day one, and then like top eight uh, straight from after that. So uh, in this season, I think it's like you have seven rounds, and then you have to go like five two, or maybe eight rounds, and then you have to go six two. It just depends on like the player amount in the seniors and juniors. Mm -hmm. So like, mm, and then there's like like Zach mentioned, there's like I think only two rounds in day two, so it's it's just gonna be like once again the uh, six rounds plus the two rounds, and like those two rounds are like very very impactful. Uh, because like just if you lose one of them you're already out of it and then like uh, the, because the people will have so many same records there will be, will be so many people who's gonna be like uh, let's say you're going to 6-2 then you let's say you win your game you're 7-2 then you lose your last one you're 7-3 there's gonna be so many of these 7-3 players and then now the tiebreakers are gonna be like coming in usually so like you will be it's like completely off your opponent's win percentage like will you will you make top 16 will you make top 32 because like those, there are also like definitely like big uh like cash pricing differences and uh, championship point differences in like those top 16 top 32s right but like overall uh as a player who ages up from senior division to master division and i think like in the first of all in the master division it's just like um the tournament tournament level is just like much or maybe the level is not much higher but i would say like the just like the um it's much harder for you to like be perform well out of like let's say 1500 players sure. compared to like 200 players because like the senior division tournaments are much much smaller so like mm -hmm. um, 
people people are there are so much uh, less people out there so uh, it's like it's completely a different thing and also like in the senior division i felt like when i was playing there uh, once you like win win the first few rounds you will be playing against like the top seniors in like the top mm -hmm. tables and like you will uh, for example when i was a senior i like pretty much knew what the decks my, my friends were playing and like my friends were also like top seniors out there so then actually what happened is like i end up playing against my friend who, who we like tested against in a testing match so like we play <laughs> against the same people but then like in a master tournament you're probably not hitting your testing partner like right or maybe you are maybe you are but it's it's probably not happening so, right. so the odds are pretty like, low for something that's, like that. a, that's a big difference as well i would say right absolutely okay now we're gonna uh kind of shift the gear because i think that we're we're kind of beating a, a dead horse with the the new structure we know that there's some changes that have to happen but speaking of changes we're seeing an old deck come back after louisville regionals now we're looking into lil where a lot of players from you know europe love to play this style of deck and the deck that we're going to talk about here is lost zone box we saw michael davidson get the finalist spot here with lost zone box a lot of the members of ddg uh were playing lost zone box but a lot of people were playing that so uh arnie i want to talk to you a little bit more about lost zone box is it time to select flowers again and feel alive uh, or do we think that maybe Lost Zone had a really good weekend and now we're putting it back in the binder here? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so definitely Lost Zone Box was a good play for the weekend. It was got second place and also like top, top 32, I think it was sure. 70th and top 64. So like it was pretty good. But like like you said, uh, good play for the weekend. I think it is it is like pretty true since like people's people weren't like really expecting to play against lost zone box mm -hmm. and like the, the deck, deck lists weren't hunting like any tech cards in lost zone box and stuff like that and then like also just uh, the players who played lost zone box were also like very good players like right. michael davidson who got top 18 worlds and like nathan ginsburg i think plays mm -hmm. as well and um kayla Brogers, and like all very good players so like of course when these good players are playing a deck they have been practicing a lot i think Andrew hedrick also the nic champion yes, was playing yeah, it yeah. so when the good okay. players are playing with the deck they are gonna perform well like especially when they have been training training enough with the deck and turning off the matchups and then when the opponents are like unprepared into the matchups they are pretty good but then like overall now when lost box is known i'm not entirely sure like how good is it going to be in the future like mm. uh, for example with on the fi finals like uh, the, even though lost on box is trying to be like a turbo deck and a very consistent turbo deck michael davison wasn't able to like get a, a pretty get that good setup in like game number two and game number three in the finals and uh then like Caleb, uh Caleb Sherman was just able to run over so like I wouldn't say like Lost Zone Box is like too good but I would say like it's like it's okay it's it's not got bad it. got it got yeah. it uh yeah Christian I guess I want your taste because you uh obviously won a regional with a Lost Zone variant right we looked yeah. at uh Sable's Ard. do you think that there is a world where we start to see difference or a different variants of Lost Zone come out because now we're not so scared of Dust Noir. Or do you think that more people are going to start playing Dust Noir decks to combat the Lost Zone resurgence here? Yeah, so I think Lost Zone's in a very interesting spot. First of all, it was, of course, a, a pretty good call for uh, Louisville, I think. Um, but its matchup spread is still far from perfect, in my opinion. I do think both like this Turbo Lost Zone deck with the Iron Hands and the Radiant Greninja. Uh, as well as uh, maybe more traditional Sablezard builds, uh, are both kind of in similar spots in the meta. I'm more inclined to say that uh, the Iron Hands uh, Radiant Greninja build is just better right now. Uh, it seems to have a better matchup spread, just kind of is the overall better deck in this format. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, Lost Zone still has the same issues it's had for you know the last couple of months, right? Sure. Ever since Shred of Fables. Namely, your Red Drago matchup is, put simply, terrible, right? <laughs> Um, it's, it, there's no sugarcoating it. It's really, really, really bad. Like, it's not unwinnable, but you cannot, as a, uh, Lost Zone player, go into a regional and say, I think I can beat Reggie Drago. Mm -hmm. Sure, if you play Monkey Dory, Dark Energy, and Double Manaphy, you maybe can, right. but then all your other matchups are terrible. <laughs> so, there's no point, right? Um... So it's really it's really a matter of where I think the meta is and what your matchups kind of get you, right? Um, overall, I think Lost Zone is fine. Um, it's, it's That's kind of the best way to describe it. It's just fine. You hit the right matchups, your deck pops off, the deck is amazing. No questions asked. We all know how powerful Comfy and Culver's are, right? Like, there's, there's nothing to add there. Uh, but you can just have your run, you know, cut short by 
or Reggie Drago, right? There's a couple other matchups that aren't exactly perfect. I think right. Dusknoir isn't as big of a problem for this deck as it is for maybe other one prize decks, or especially like the evolving decks, right? right. Uh, because Dusknoir inherently is a card that is meant to push an aggressive advantage. Um, and if you, as the Lost Zone player, are able to take that initi initiative, especially if you're able to go up two prize cards early with maybe a Greninja or an Iron Hands, uh, then the Dusknoir has very little impact in the game. It's, of course, something you have to watch out for. No questions asked there, but mm. I don't think it's, like, your main concern. Um, mm. But really, it's it's just a matter of, I think, Lost Zone right now is almost the dictionary definition of a Tier 2 deck. Right. Right. It's just good. You hit the right matchups, you're doing great. You hit the wrong matchups, you're going 0-3 drop, right? Right. Um, it's, it's rough out there. Um, I think you can, especially if you're a really good Lost Zone pilot, you can get away with, you know, playing Lost Zone, flipping, uh, or what's called picking flowers, and you can do a very, have a very deep run. Frankly, I think Michael probably should have won Louisville. No, you know, not to discredit Caleb, of course, but right. Michael drew really, really poorly both in games two and three, right? I think in game three, well, even also in game two, but notably in game three, right. he did not play a single Colrus, right? Um, so actually for two games in a row, he didn't play Colrus. So, I mean, that that does also mean that Michael in the finals had an 100% win rate in every game he played a Colrus, which is... <laughs> A telling statistic. Obviously, it was deeper than that, right? Uh, right. I think Caleb's list um, was also uniquely challenging for Lost Box. Uh, we'll get into that later, I'm assuming. But mm -hmm. um, it was not a good matchup. Yeah. It was not a no. Good matchup. No. I still think, I like, favorably matchup wise, like, Michael should still have won that. Um, but, like, it's not. Caleb's list wasn't exactly, like, the most normal Raging Bolt list, at, lo at least by the standards of pre Louisville, right? right. Um, but to kind of end the rant, um, I think Lost Zone is fine. Uh, if you like playing Lost Zone, you can absolutely play Lost Zone. If you know your matchups, uh, you tech for the right stuff, I think you're chilling. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's like a BDIF contender, because then I'd just be lying to you, right? So, <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> right. Now, we kind of look at, the obviously, the finals matchup here with Caleb and Zach. You and I had talked pre Lewis Bill that, you know, Playing the most consistent deck might just be the call here. Mm -hmm. And looking at Michael's list, which was pretty consistent as far as a loss on box deck goes, we still saw it kind of fail. Now, uh, we look at um, we look at the Raging Bolt side of things, where Raging Bolt, the list that was played, was a little bit different. Now, Raging Bolt winning a regional, not necessarily <clears throat> unsurprising, uh, but I want to get your takes on Raging Bull into this meta. Are we seeing it? Because it's the most efficient deck in format from what we're seeing. Do you think that it's still going to be a great call until we get some new archetype and maybe a future set? Yeah, so I think uh, I think I think it's one of those decks that it just becomes a staple deck in our meta game. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like anyone who's playing the game at a competitive level should probably have most of these staple decks built. Like if you don't have a Raging uh, Bull deck built. Uh, I mean, obviously, play within your budget, but sure. with the way that Pokemon decks are kind of priced, it's a deck that you should pretty much have on you at all times because it's a staple pick in the meta. Um, I thought that the builds coming out of uh, this weekend were pretty interesting, going mm -hmm. with more of a Bravery Charm approach. We've right. seen that with previous archetypes where um, you just shift a few cards a little bit that can drastically change how your matchup spreads go. Exactly. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's the most consistent way to be playing the deck. Definitely mm -hmm. can't be when we're cutting consistency cards for Bravery Charms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the stream game that showed it the most um, maybe was... Uh, the game against Xander Pro and Ian Robb, yes. where uh, Xander Pro was able to kind of block all of the damage and options that Ian had on board by having, I think, four Bravery Charms, meaning that Ian couldn't win the game. I think as we see uh, top players kind of come up with these changes to top decks, um, from time to time, you can kind of adjust the way the decks play out. So Raging Bull went from very much a... Uh, like, we, we could literally track this deck however it goes. Like, turn one, you either get off your Professor Sada or not. And then everything else goes. There's very little room. I think the Bravery Charms added a lot of playability to the deck and allowed you to kind of script your own games better. And I think when uh, top players are playing a top consistent deck that can knock out Pokemon in the field and they have control over how that works now, that's probably what brought Raging Bull to the next level. Because uh, previously, it's like, yep, Great, th that Ian game would have been locked up on stream where Ian had the double dust noir, the blood moon, 
you win the game every single time. It's impossible to win the game. They changed that narrative, which I thought was incredibly interesting. Now, if we fast forward into little regionals, I think that um, anytime a deck wins, it's still a fine choice the next weekend. Um, and obviously, regionals can uh, vastly differ in metagames across the world. But um, I do think that there's a gigantic asterisk over Raging Bolt right now because people are expecting it. So they're either like, we're probably going to see play spike a little bit because Raging Bolt is a popular deck. It's an easy deck to acquire. <clears throat> they just came up with those new pr promo Raging Bolts. They look right. sick. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to play those, that's cool. But uh, do I think that people are going to feed into it? We might see a resurgence of single prize card decks, similar to what we saw at Louisville Regionals. Um, we might see decks like Ancient Box might pop up a little bit because they typically have a pretty good matchup. Right. We could see a handful of other decks. I know even earlier this season, I played a Blood Moon, Ursaluna, Iron Valiant deck to try to counter some that like there's a lot of options when it comes down to it so we can see people going for deep cuts but i do think it's really cool to watch how top players are kind of um kind of changing the metagame at their own will where it's like we add bravery charms into raging bolt to fix this problem we do bring back the deep cut of lost zone box that was hovering around the top 20 or so deck mark um, and now people are probably going to play Lost Zone Box. So um, going forward, is it a good play? Undeniably, Raging Bolt, it's done so much, it's seen so much success. It is a good play. Is it the best play? It, it definitely cannot be the best play. It could win the event, but it's not the best play. Got it. All right, Christian, over to you with Raging Bolt here. I have some questions for you. Now, if you are looking at Raging Bolt, uh, or trying to tech against it with whatever your play is. Uh, what are your thoughts on cards like Bravery Charm being staples in the list, multiple Bravery Charm, uh, meaning Briar is another card that we kind of saw splashed in and out of certain Raging Bolt lists, and also Switch Cart. We saw Counts of Switch Cart toggle up and down here on Raging Bolt. So for those three cards in Raging Bolt, I want to get your take on each one of those. Yeah, so Raging Bolt's in a really interesting spot right now. Uh, myself, uh, as well as a lot of other players, were kind of hating on the deck, uh, namely due to its linearity. Mm -hmm. um, but as Zach put really well, uh, the way that, namely both Xander and Caleb, and I, I think Grant as well, Grant Manley, mm -hmm. uh, played the deck with these heavy counts of cards like Bravery Charm and Switch Cart, kind of add not necessarily more skill expression, but a lot more counterplay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that... Um, the Ian Xander game on stream was actually a really good example. Uh, shameless plug. I bought viewed the entire thing on my Twitch. Uh, go check it out. It was a great stream. It's a great stream. Uh, <laughs> but um, getting back to the topic on hand, I do think the deck is fundamentally better with these higher counts of cards like Switch Cards and Bravery Charm, right? Especially considering that it actually kind of goes against um, a lot of the ideas a lot of people had for Raging Bolt as an archetype, right? Uh, personally, before Louisville, um, if I was going to play Raging Bolt, I would have gone for a hyper-consistent, no bravery charms, few counts of switch cards, just full gas, go Raging Bolt list, right? Nothing else, don't want to worry about it, I just want to, you know, press go, right? Because the general idea then is that you are the most consistent deck in the room, you go fast, you hit hard, you knock out everything, right? And your general game plan is that if at any point, regardless of matchup, your opponent bricks, uh, you just win the game on the spot, right? And that is statistically a good thing because you are the most consistent deck in the room, right? Uh, you can kind of get away with that. And of course, then you have, you know, other really good matchups as well. Um, that said, I think while that's a fine way to play Raging Bolt, I think the Bravery Charms and the Switch Cart and the Briar to an extent uh, are the changes to this deck that m takes from a good to a great deck, right? Um, adding these Bravery Charms, adding these Switch Carts... Um, and again, the Briar is kind of like a patch for a lot of your worst matchups, um, means that the deck is not only less linear, uh, but it also has more inherent counterplay into situations and into matchups that it notoriously lost to earlier. Uh, Briar, of course, being amazing to beat Charizard, mm -hmm. uh, is great into any single prize matchups, um, like Ancient Box or Gardevoir. Doesn't mean you beat these matchups automatically, of course, but it gives you counterplay. Uh, that you wouldn't otherwise have, right? Uh, and the same thing applies to the Switch Cards and the Bravery Charm. We, of course, have the Polka Dustmore example. The example really helps into 
uh, any of the Dust More decks, frankly, right? With the Bravery Charms. Right. Um, it's not just like you play two and then one gets vacuumed. Having the three count not only means you find them more often, but you can also put more on some, more of them onto the board. Uh, as well as the high switch counts, a lot of lists played like one, sometimes even zero, maybe two. Mm -hmm. But with three, not only, again, is your deck, you know, moving around more, right? Obviously playing more switch cards, but you have more healing options, which synergizes with the Bravery Charm to just make your deck more bulky uh, and lets you set up like these pseudo checkmate positions where a board state for your opponent that should be game winning is now not game winning. And then it doesn't matter that you can't Iono or, I don't know, a Crushing Hammer or Temple of Sinnoh or whatever other disruption uh, towards your opponent. You can just set up a board they can't beat and then nothing else matters, right? Right. Uh, so I think the changes are really good, but uh, one thing I will say as far as Raging Bolt is concerned is I think you're either going one of two directions as a Raging Bolt pilot in this format. You're either going all in on the gas, like no charms, one switch card, max all your consistency counts, or you're playing the Bravery Charms, the, like the high Bravery Charm, high switch count. I don't want to see any in between. If right. you say if you're playing two, if you're playing two uh, uh, charms, yeah. stop. <laughs> Play three or four or zero. Right. Right. Uh, I don't want to see that in between. Just maximize either of the uh, of the lines there. Perfect, perfect. All right, now we're talking about counterplay too, and and we're going to talk about uh, favorite decks here because uh, Arnie, I know that you have one of these as your favorite decks, and I have the other here. Uh, you know, uh, we're we're going to talk about Lugia. I know you've played Lugia quite a bit here <laughs> beforehand. Um, so, are we teching in Lil? more for Lugia decks because we see it perform so well and it's so consistent. We see Rahul Reddy, we see Kieran Farah from, you know, the States continuously perform with these decks or now we're seeing more Snorlax because it's a great play. A lot of players don't know how to play against it. Obviously it can win European regionals. We've seen that before. So which one are you more scared of and which one would you be teching for going into Lil? Alright, so uh, first of all, like Overall, when I'm building my decks, uh, the mentality that I'm having is like, uh, I don't don't want to think about the tech cards in the beginning. Like first, I'm just gonna make my deck like very consistent and like just make sure like it setups and like does what it needs to do. And then mm -hmm. I'm looking like uh, some matchups like uh, does this matchup look good to me or uh, should I maybe tech for it? And then I might add the uh, card in there like uh, as Logia. I wanna put the enhanced hammer or maybe the Temple of Sino and against sure. Snorlax maybe like the. Professor Taro, right. but, and like usually uh, I'm still like against one of these these cards where like you take against just for one deck because like when you're playing the card you really have to play against that one deck if you want to get the use of it and then against every other deck um, that card just doesn't do anything like if you have the enhanced hammer and you're playing against the Raging Bolt you're just mm -hmm. not doing anything you're just like you're not wishing like this could be like anything else this could be like literally like a trekking shoe you can get sure. like one extra card with it <laughs> but it's back uh, shoe. <laughs> <yep. laughs> exactly that's the best card in me VM by the way uh, but yeah anyways <laughs> so uh i'm like kind of against this one card the decks against like one uh one deck in general but then like for example in world championships and for the uh dotman regions i i did like uh have a thought about this and then i was thinking like what card could counter like lugia and snorlax in the same time mm -hmm. then i was thinking it could be actually the uh, Spirit Tomb, oh, because yeah. you know Sp Spirit Tomb, it's blocking the Luminian from Lugias, mm -hmm. and it's also blocking the Rotom from Snorlax. So like, if you're playing Spirit Tomb, it is like a little bit less efficient uh, than like the Enhanced Hammer against Lugia, but it's still like a very good card against two decks in the same time. So now like, when you're playing this deck card, you have a higher chance that you're gonna hit like uh, one of the one of the decks you're just trying to play it against. Like in Dortmund, I did play the. Um, uh, Spirit Tomb, and I was thinking like it's good against Lugia, it's good against Snorlax, and I didn't hit any Lugia, but I did hit two Snorlax actually, and I was able to like beat one of them and tie against one of the other, but like if I would have the NS Hammer, I think I would have probably lost those matches, and then I didn't play against any Lugia, so the NS Hammer would, would not have done anything for me, so I think overall like when you're looking at these deck cards, you should try to go for the deck card that is like uh, better for like overall meta game, but then also like, let's say you're playing Shard. If you're playing Shard with Rotom and Luminian, you maybe don't want to put the Spiritum in there. Mm -hmm. So now if you have to make a decision, like, for example, do you put, like, a second 
Terra in the deck, or maybe mm. like the Enhanced Hammer. I would maybe lean towards the Enhanced Hammer still, since like I, I would say like the Lugia, Lugia is still like a pretty popular deck, and it's, a, it's also like, I think Lugia is like much more easier deck to play right. compared to the uh, Snorlax. So like, just like the average players are more likely to play uh, Lugia instead of like Snorlax, I would say. Exactly. And then we would see, you know, obviously dual use, just like you were talking about with cards like Tropagos, right, with the Enhanced Hammer, mm. so we get a little bit more yep. use out of that card. That's true, that's true. It does help against Terabagos a little bit, but right. I think also just against Terabagos, it's not like it's not like that much uh, compared to the Lugia, but it still helps a little bit. So yeah, sure. exactly. Um, now talking about that, Sharni brought up a, a good point here where we're talking about the Spiritomb index. But another little purple card that I noticed a lot of people teching in for a couple of those matchups was Klefki. And we saw Klefki pop into a couple of lists. We saw it in Gardevoir. Um, you know, we see it in other Lugia lists that I see popping up. So, Christian, what are your thoughts on Klefki for text for, like, Lugia? Well, not, not so much Lugia, but obviously it does help in certain situations. We look at Raging Bolt. We look at the Rotom into a Snorlax deck. What do you think about Klefki in these decks? Yeah, hi. So, Notorious Klefki pilot here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Klefki's really good right now. Uh, kind of for the same reason I also think Spiritomb's really good right now. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to actually talk more about how I think teching for Lugia is better than teching for Snorlax, just sure. kind of off the basis that there's more Lugia in the room, statistically, yeah. right? It's just a numbers game. But uh, I actually think the Spiritomb's just like a really good card right now, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it not only beats uh, Lugia and um block lacks but it's also really good into a lot of decks that rely on rotom a lot of these decks that want to play luminian right uh namely uh of course being uh i would say a charizard uh, any pidgeot variants really uh do really really want both their luminian and their rotom for a game mm -hmm. uh, and i think playing the spirit tomb to kind of tech for it's not really a tech at that point it's just a good overall disruptive card of course not every deck gets to play spirit tomb right decks sure. that Play, want to play their own Rotoms and Luminians, probably should not be playing Spirit Tomb. Um, you don't want to handicap yourself that way. Right. But I think if you're playing a deck that um, isn't reliant on Pokemon V abilities, sure. I actually think Spirit Tomb is an amazing call for this weekend, uh, and really just in general in the format. Yeah. Um, going back to Clef Key, I think it's good for the same reason Spirit Tomb is, right? It blocks a bunch of stuff, it blocks even more stuff. Of course, if Comfy gets better, Clef Key is amazing. Right, uh, in, in basically any deck. Uh, Klefki has a bunch of other niche use cases, stuff like blocking Fan Rotom on turn one is really good. Stuff like blocking Ogre Pond, right? Of course, you only block Ogre Pond for reasonably one or two turns, but sure. it could be the difference between whether or not you're the first one to attack uh, against, say, um, I don't know, Raging Bolt, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe um, Richard Drago. Right. So I think Klefki is a really good card. I think any deck that, again, doesn't lose to having Klefki on their board yep. um, could play Klefki to a great effect. I think Klefki is really good. Um, I'd namely presume that to be, you know, decks like Gardevoir uh, should be playing Klefki. Uh, Gardevoir is in a weird spot right now. I think that's kind of the issue for specifically Klefki is actually just that a lot of the decks that want to play Klefki or could play Klefki aren't that good. Mm -hmm. You could start throwing Klefki into more... Uh, like it has like a niche pick in other decks. We have seen Lugia players playing Klefki. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Azul, namely, is a big fan of that. Um, but none of the super successful lists have, playing the Klef have been playing the Klefki uh, as Lugia players. So maybe that's worth considering as a Lugia player this weekend if you want to bring the Klefki. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where I think the card is inherently really good. I just don't know what would play it. Um, so I'm kind of conflicted. But uh, of course, if... Uh, kind of asked to choose. I think checking for Lugia is just overall better. Um, again, just because it's a numbers game, right? And even at day two, if you look at the top 32 of Blue as well, I believe there was three Lugia and three Block Slacks, maybe yeah. only two Block Slacks. It's something like that. Um, but it was pretty evenly represented. Yeah. Um, I was going to say across in the, the top board, 16. It was, it was pretty so. big. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I saw we see uh, 12th place, we've got a Snorlax. But mm -hmm. we have a sixth place Lugia, right? <laughs> and we've got yeah, this is true. This eight, is true. Eighth place Lugia again, and then again in twentieth place Cal Connor uh, with another mm -hmm. Snorlax. So they're still up there. So both decks yeah. are pretty relevant right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I would like to tech for both. Yeah. But 
Um, if possible, I play Spirit Tomb. If you can't play Spirit Tomb, I choose to put, I choose to sack for Lugia. Got it. Yeah, you yeah. heard it here first, Christian. If you're going to Lil, suggest uh, four Spirit Tomb in your deck. Just put all. Four Absolutely, in. that's <laughs> definitely a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, going over to Zach now. Uh, Zach, we were kind of talking about good and bad plays for these upcoming regionals, and we saw a couple of these decks kind of perform. We're going to talk about Charizard. Uh, we we saw players like Azul post a very vanilla Charizard list, very consistent. We look at these other lists, very consistent decks, uh, and we thought going into this, we look at all the tier lists amongst all the Pokemon TCG creators, all calling Charizard a not so great play, a B tier play, if you will. So, what are your thoughts on Charizard now after? looking at these results going into lil um i think my stance on charizard is probably going to be very similar to um kind of like loss unbox where i think uh typically if you have a pilot that's more than capable of playing the deck um we see it like i don't think lugia is arguably the best deck in this for format but you get players like kieran that play it they are playing the deck almost perfectly. I think we saw that in the case of, uh, I believe it was Sebastian that played uh, the Charizard deck. So watching them play the deck expertly, they took down that Regid Drago in the top eight. Mm. Um, it, it's one of those things where if you're a competent uh, pilot of a deck, I don't think that the metagame is always going to matter because everyone's individual tournament is going to vary. Sure, maybe you'll play Charizard and you're going to run into bad matchup after bad matchup. Like, anyone can have a rough tournament run. But I think right now, um, we're kind of in a format where we saw, I think, the top eight featured almost eight different decks or maybe six yes. different decks, whatever. Um, I, th there's no way to make Charizard a bad play at that point because it's the only deck, as far as I know, that self-accelerates energy. Mm -hmm. Its damage grows as the game progresses. It has a large amount of HP. And it has a very solid core skeleton behind it, something that we just can't necessarily get there. So while players are still deciding those last five spots in Terrapico's decks, Charizard is pretty much well decided, and we understand what the deck looks like, so anyone can play it. So across the board, Charizard, I think um, it's neither a great play or neither a bad play. I think it's heavily dependent on if it's an archetype that you can relate to, that you've played before, mm -hmm. and um, can you see success now? Is it better now based off the results of Louisville? Um, maybe. I think like between Raging Bolt and Lost Zone Box seeing success, maybe Charizard does okay into those matchups a little bit more often. Mm -hmm. So as we have players that are going to be picking up those decks, um, anyone who's going to immediately hop onto those decks after the success of the regionals, might not pilot them as well as the players that got them to that position. Charizard typically can do okay against those matchups across the board, um, especially if you're playing against weaker players. So if you're a strong Charizard pilot, I think Charizard is probably a fine choice for this upcoming weekend. Yeah. But do not be blind to the to the danger that Charizard has in this format, right. where I think there are Dust Noir decks out there. I do think there's Briar decks out there. Uh, Raging Bolt can play Briar, which can add problems to your deck. I think there's a lot of things that could be problematic for Charizard, but mm -hmm. if you know what you're getting into and you think you're a, a fine Charizard pilot, then I think it's an acceptable play for sure. Absolutely. And going over to you, Arnie, I want to talk about Charizard and some of the text that we did see. And if we're expecting some Charizard players over in Lil to be playing these, we saw Heroes Cape start to come back into the meta a little bit more uh, over things like the Unfair Stamp and things like Prime Catcher. I still think that is a pretty good tech to put into decks uh, with the Heroes Cape. And I still think that Unfair Stamp might also be a decent secondary a spec for these lists uh, but we also saw some mist energy come in here too so we could not see spread from decks like dragapult so what are your thoughts on uh, the tech cards that are going into a charizard list now yeah so like i think overall charizard lists have been they have been kind of this is like kind of similar to like my good, good friend sebastian said who got the four so like Treasure decks have been uh, doing all of those deck cards in their decks in order to beat Regirago, which was like right. by far the number one most played deck. Right. But recently, Regirago has been falling off a little bit. And also, I think now because of Raging Bolt, did just win the tournament. I think Regirago is also like going down once again because like the Regirago matchup with the Brave Charms isn't isn't very good for the Regirago. So 
because Rage Drago is going down in popularity, mm. we could see the Charizard deck uh, play, like maybe cutting down on these deck cards. Like for example, Torrek Club in the World Championships, he did play a Rapska in his deck just right. to like counter the Dragapult spread from the and maybe I guess some other things as well. But like uh, mostly the Dragapult spread from the Rage Drago. Sure. So now Charizard lists are not running that anymore. So now they can be doing all of their own stuff. Like for example, with the Dorton and the Iridian Charizard uh, lists. Like that's one way to do it and then like when we talk about the a specs um i think also like the hero scape is mm -hmm. like was like the um, the reason to play hero scape was that okapon cannot one shot you even though the okapon would have like four energies in it mm -hmm. um but uh right now i think if, if okapons are not going to be that popular uh you could could be seeing something else like an unfair stamp for example because the unfair stamp is just like a very it's like a consistency card also right. since like it draws your cards disrupts your opponent and it's yeah. like it's kind of the same as like in the uh, tech discussion that unfair stamp is like good against everything when hero escape is just good against the decks that run okapon or like or some other decks as well like there are some other situations where the extra hp does come handy but mm -hmm. like in most of the situations i do still think that it is probably best to play the unfair stamp right. then i also did see or like i don't know how i see it in like the louisville but in dortmund at least there was like some shirts running the new grand tree the right. uh, that aspect but uh I, I haven't seen that much people play it, and I think probably like the reason is that when you are playing the Grand Tree, you have to include that Pidgeotto in your deck and like the uh, Dust Clubs. Like I think uh, most of them are running Dust Clubs, but like you gotta like add more slots into your deck. So like, is it actually like making your deck more consistent when you are like putting on all of this other other stuff in your deck? And then also you give give it to your opponent. So like right. most of the decks are running some evolution cards that they could be or, like not most of the deck, but I would say like. Uh, much much of the decks are playing those evolution cards that so like if your opponent just plays the grand tree there you go you get the free yeah. evolution you know you can use like say your armor for something else than the ultra ball you get get the pokemon and you can get the pokemon straight off it there and now you can use your, let's say you can use your bosses orders instead of the armor and your opponent can go for a much stronger place when you play the grand tree down so i also think that grand tree isn't isn't the best aspect but i would say definitely that the unfair stamp is the best one and mm -hmm. if you are expecting a lot of like the rishirago and that stuff you could say the hero escape is the right. second best one exactly yeah because uh 430 is a lot more than 330 where uh, a dust noir and a terrapagos can just take you out uh, yeah. so i mean I, I definitely see the merit in both uh if you're gusting up uh pheasantipity and then unfair stamping somebody also pretty detrimental to a game plan on all these decks that are reliant on these draw pokemon uh so you know with that being said we're, we're looking at these other decks that can do a max amount of damage and we were looking at these other decks terrorizing louisville and now we're looking into lil we're going to look at terrapagos and dragapult a little bit more so christian do you think that these decks weren't spooky enough uh people didn't necessarily gravitate to them we did see gabe smart get a top eight with terrapagos dust noir um on you know, a pretty vanilla list, what we considered to be a vanilla Terrapagos list. We didn't see hardly any Dragapults do really, really well. I think that there was a couple in the top 16 here. Um, let's see. There was literally none. In, none in, no, sorry. <laughs> literally none in the top 16. Yeah, Just kidding. The, uh, there was the one in the top 32, uh, yeah. the top 24th place, I believe. Yeah. Um, and that was it. So what happened to these two decks, in your opinion? Yeah, so, I mean, Terrapagos' performance to me is fine, right? Like, I'm not concerned about Terrapagos. I think that's still very strong. Yeah. I think overall, I would consider it to be the best abuser of Duskmore, namely just because you have this ease of use for your Noctowls. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to, right? Especially for uh, kind of these three big Duskmore decks, in my opinion, being the Dragapult Duskmore that won Dortmund, the Palkia Duskmore build we've seen see a lot of success. I think it's back-to-back -back top fours, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Um... And then, uh, yeah, back-to-back -back top fours, uh, so Dortmund, and then I guess there was a weekend in Lima, but I don't know what happened there. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, of course, the Terrapagos, right, uh, as well. All three of these decks playing Dustmore, all three of these decks very popular, all three right. of these decks very good. Um, but I think the main reason we're seeing Dragapult in particular fall off is, first of all, uh, off of its, you know, success in Dortmund, I think a lot of people were prepared for the deck. Uh, in whatever way they could, it's not like a deck you can hard tech for, sure. but uh, at least people were like practicing the matchup, maybe. Right. Um, but also maybe just the deck 
and honestly is maybe just not as good as Terrapagos and Palkia, if I'm being honest. I think that I think Dragon Ball Dustmore is very, very, very powerful. I think I, I actually cannot underestimate how ridiculously unfair that deck can be when you just go Dragapult, Crystal Energy, I don't know, Roxanne, whatever, yep. pop a bunch of Dustmores, go. Like, I had a, just as, as, as an example, I had a coaching session the other day where I think my student playing Trapagos uh, killed all three of my Dreepies on turn two, right? Like, my board is just empty. Um, and I think I go put my last Dreepy into play, I don't know, put some random Dust Skulls in play, Fez, Rotom, Pass, yeah. right, with an Iona to four. Sure. They miss boss on the Dreepy. The game immediately ends because I go Candy, Pult, Crystal. like, pop crystal pop dust moors rock sand set up like this unbeatable board state and state and immediately win the game like i i, use, I attacked once and i checkmated it's ridiculous <laughs> right it's absolutely ridiculous but i still needed to do a bunch of stuff as a dragon sure. pilot there right um and if you're able to set that up then yeah dragon bolt's undeniably great but is it better than doing almost the same thing as Palkia, right? Where Palkia can just board wipe better than Dragapult can, right. but simply, right? right, right. Um, maybe it's, you know, is it better than Trapagos? Trapagos being an inherently more consistent deck, right? That isn't as prone to losing to, um, of course, uh, Dusknoir plays. And really, I think that's what it boils down to, right? I think Dragapult Dusknoir is the Dusknoir deck that loses to Dusknoir. Right. So as long as Palkia and Terrapicos continue to see a lot of play, then it's not a great meta for Dragapult. Of course, I think Dragapult has sure. a fine matchup into both of those decks, but yeah. it's inherently kind of out of your control. Right. You can't change the outcome if your opponent wipes four GP from your board as a Palkia player. Like, there's no counterplay to that. You just lose. <laughs> um, so it's not it's not that Dragapult's bad, and I do expect the deck to continue to perform but i don't think we're going to see it reach the heights of dormant anytime soon sure uh Trapagos, on the other hand is completely fine and i would not be surprised if it won its tournament like hmm. i would not if Trapagos won lil i would not be remotely surprised um that's fair yeah got it all right zach now with all of this knowledge here that we've given the people listening i want you to kind of go off and use that what are your top five predictions for what's going to show up in the meta at Lil. What do you think is going to be on that day one graphic as five most played decks? Um, Raging Bolt Lugia default two. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm doing these out of order, by the way. So in general, I think it's it's uh, no witch hunts. Pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Um, I think uh, I think we're going to see Terrapagos go into the top five. I sure. think it already was there for Louisville. Yeah. Um, so that's three. Um, Arguably, I think Dragapult's going to take a step back like it did in Louisville because Raging Bolt just won. I think it's really hard to uh, play that matchup out. I don't think Snorlax is going to get there. Sorry, I'm just looking at like Limitless and just looking at all the different decks right now that sure. exist in the format. Because there's just so many different decks right now um, in format. Right now. So what did I say? I said Raging Bolt, Lugia, Terrapagos. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Palkia there as well because I feel like that's almost hand-in-hand -hand with Terrapagos. So that's sure. four decks. And if we go to Stellar Pound, I think Drago's probably rounds out the top five. Okay. Um, Charizard is probably up there within the top six mm -hmm. um, overall, but I think that's that's generally where I'd put it is. Um, I think Raging Bolt's going to be number one. I think we're going to see Lugia, like, number two. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to see Trapagos, Palkia, and Regidrago. And we might be replacing one of those decks with Charizard, and I think that's our top six. Okay. Um, but the top five's within there. Perfect. All right, and then Christian, do you think that you'd agree or disagree with that top five or replace some? Yeah, so I, I largely agree. Uh, this meta is in extremely buried, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think to me, there's like kind of like a tear break between most decks at like a top seven. Which, first of all, is kind of an absurd thing to say, yeah. right? We have a top seven. Um, there's a lot of really good decks. And there's kind of seven decks there that sure. I would not be surprised if they won a regional. Uh, that would be Raging Bolt, Lugia, Charizard, Dragapult, Terrapagos, Palkia, Regidrago. I didn't repeat any, did I? No. no. Um, as for a top five, especially going into Lil, what I expect play rate-wise... 
Um, is I think the order is kind of up in the air. I think Raging Bolt's going to be the most played deck, and I think Terrapagos is going to be number two. From there, it's kind of up in the air, but I would probably say Lugia, Regidrago, then Charizard. I think uh, both Palkia and... I think Palkia's number six, Dragapult's number seven, but um, honestly, those like bottom five could rotate. I think Lugia will definitely make the graphic. I think Richie Drago will definitely make the graphic. So really, the number five spot is actually just between Charizard, Dragapult, and Palkia. But I think a lot of people really like playing uh, Charizard. I think all people really needed as like an excuse to jump back on Charizard was the top four finish, right? Yeah. Like all the Charizard players who were scared to play the deck because of Duskmore now have that validation to go back on the deck. So they're going to do so, right? Um, and I think the deck is just fine, uh, as it is. So, yeah, uh, that would be my top five. Gotcha. Uh, Arnie, agree or disagree with those top five, or do you have any other suggestions here? Yeah, I do mostly agree with them. Like, uh, like, like I mentioned, I think Raging Bolt is going to be the most popular one. Terrapagos, probably number two. Uh, Logia, I would say number three, just because, like, Logia is always out there. Uh, then... Uh, maybe I would maybe say Charizard could be even like maybe number four since like Charizard is now getting the hype that it has been having. Then like maybe number five would be the Regirago and then like you mentioned, if you, if you have to say a sixth deck, it could be like the Palkia Dusknor probably. Right. But right. yeah, overall, overall I think it's uh, it's pretty like a wide meta game and like also if you're not playing a deck that's in this list, like if you're very comfortable on your deck and like you really don't know how to play it and you know your matchup as well, I think it's also like a very good play for the tournament. So like, very cool. All right, now we're getting to my favorite part of these meta forecasts. It's the rogue deck side of things. So we're going to talk about what rogue deck that doesn't necessarily appear in any sort of day one, day two graphics. It's kind of an off meta deck, but we think we can make a nice deep run with it. I'm going to first go off and say, because I played this in the TCG Challenge at Louisville, and I also played it at Late Night EU with a pretty decent finish, is Venomoth Frostless. I think that, that could be, <laughs> make a pretty cool run. Bro owns the Venomoth. I really want the Thank Venomoth. You, You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, so I think the item lock is very cool. Confusion also very cool. And racking up damage with Frostless is a nice spicy touch. Uh, Arnie, what do you think? What rogue deck do you want to see do well here? Uh, in Louisville, we had the epic match between Clove and Okie Doggy. Yes. So <laughs> I, I think the, both of those decks are pretty good since like the, they're both fighting type Pokemon, and the fighting type is like a very good type right now. You're hitting yeah. Terrapagos for a weakness. You're also hitting Fezzendipity for a weakness, and like Fezzendipity is like every single deck runs Fezzendipity. Like if you look at this top five decks, like pretty much every single one of them runs yeah. Fezzendipity. Rotom's like, also you, fighting weak. That's true. That's true as well. Like we have a lot of stuff. So like, I would say. Let's let's put my money on Okie Doggy. Okay, I think it's Okie Doggy. Perfect, perfect. All right, Christian, place your bets here. What rogue deck do you think might make a deep run in Lil? Oh boy. Um, well, uh, there's a lot actually. I think are are pretty good. I like to firstly bring up the. I'm sorry, PJ. Uh, the better item lock deck got it, being Bennett. Sure. Um, Bennett's super good. I think Bennett's super good. Yeah. Uh, we saw Piper play it on stream. Yeah. Uh, in Louisville, I think we saw Mateus uh, do really well with it in Dortmund. Uh, I think Bennett's in a fine spot meta-wise, right? Uh, I don't think it's like the play or anything, but I would not be surprised if we saw a Bennett sneak into the top 16, maybe even the top 8, right? But sure. I expect like at least one Bennett pilot to make top 32 at the bare minimum. I think the deck is just universally super good. Uh, notable pilots in Europe, at least, would be um Matthias and uh, Magnus Peterson mm. um Danish player uh who is I think has a ninth place with Bennett and Bologna SB last season if I'm not mistaken right um and as well as other people picking up the deck I think Bennett's really really good it's hard to play um but if you do master the deck I think it's very very powerful sure. um outside of that I do think there's some like single prize decks that kind of have potential i think first of all cloth is just not as bad as we're making it out to be um i'm not gonna sit here and be like the number one hype man for the deck i do love my gimmicky one price decks but um like that deck isn't inherently terrible i won't really go into detail with it but uh it it definitely has lines i think okie dokie seems cool mm-hmm but I don't think I'd go further than that. Um, I actually thought that deck was a lot worse than it was originally because I forgot that 
okie dokie's attack cost is fighting fighting i thought it was fighting fighting colorless which would be a lot worse oh, yeah. um but if you can go you know fighting energy luminous energy you have like pretty good stats all things considered um i think the fact that we have to play energy sticker immediately makes the deck garbage um but you know we have exp share it's not the end of the world yeah um but uh, i will not be submitting energy sticker under any circumstances um so i i can't sit here in good faith telling you to play okie dokie yeah. um otherwise as far as like quote-unquote rogue decks are concerned i think the Bennett deck is like the main one to look out for namely Bennett gardevoir Got it. um cloth maybe okay otherwise not much no all right we covered a whole lot zach uh what other rogue decks do you want to talk about here for lil I do want to echo that I think the Okie Doki deck is mid. Um, I think that it's really cool. I'm sorry to all the Okie Doki lovers. It it wasn't mm -hmm. even good in the pre I don't even think it was that great during the pre-release of sure. that set. So um, that might say something. <laughs> but regardless, um, and I mean, I think it's super cool when anyone plays any rogue deck. Um, I was going to say Binet, um in general, because I think Binet, uh there's a very great group of players, I think, in Poland that are playing that deck. Yeah. Um, a handful of other players that are playing that deck. So um, it's on the fringe of where it's not really as rogue. Same thing with Cloth. Yeah. I think we've seen Cloth seen some success recently. Uh, just that type advantage is huge. Um, mm -hmm. On both being, you also have the Electrode for against the Charizard deck. So there's a lot of answers there in Cloth to the metagame. Yep. But at the end of the day, a lot of these single prize card-esque decks um, end up having some flaws as well. Yeah. Um, the one deck that I, the, well, there's there's two um that i think are interesting right now i did previously mention it like ancient box could be interesting in a world where the metagame is shifting up a little bit we've seen ancient box go on some deep runs um could could it be good against uh bravery charm uh raging bolt yeah i think it would do really good and i think uh we might see some players doing that the same thing against Terrapagos. it can also sometimes present issues there um it, it's generally a pretty good deck um but the one that I think uh, that a lot of people aren't talking about is Goldango right now. Mm -hmm. um, Goldango should do pretty good against Raging Bolt. Holds its own against Charizard. Holds its own against a lot of the metagame mm -hmm. um, right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw um, some players, maybe Jelly Van Campen goes on another tear with Goldango. Um, if, if a player continuously is doing uh, the same success with a similar style deck... There's something there, like, you just can't be like, oh, that's the player that makes top four at every regionals, right? Sure. Like, there's something there with the deck, so, um, not sure if I generally play that, um, but it is something that, like, I do have Goldango built, and I'm ready to go at any time with it, and I think, um, those are, those are the decks that I be bringing to the table in terms of rogue decks, but otherwise, um, like Christian said, the top seven's basically the top seven, yeah. Uh, there's literally nothing wrong if you pick a deck out of the top seven. It's only when you start going a little bit down below that, mm -hmm. where, like, that's where the Pidgeot controls and the Gardevoir decks. Like, if you're a Gardevoir expert, like Josh Frank, Henry Chow, maybe then it's an acceptable play for you. Yep. If you're Alessandro, play that Pidgeot like you always do. Um, if And then there's, like, maybe those fringe plays, like Iron Thorns, that kind of fall within the top ten. Sure. Fine plays, nothing wrong. But if you're picking within the top seven, you're good. Otherwise, you got to go for like a really deep cut play and have a reason to play that deck because otherwise, you just don't want to be like, I played Cloth because I like Cloth if you're trying to win the regionals. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, shout out to Cloth. Shout out to Cloth. Yeah, shout out to Cloth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, it's it's October here, and I like to give a little bit of a human element to these metaphor casts, too. So, because, you know, it's fall festivals, we want to do some fall things. Uh, if you're going to Oktoberfest, we're assuming that you're above the age of 21, and so are these uh, things that I'm going to mention. Or 18 in Europe. Well, yeah, 18, 18 in Europe. Europe. Yeah, you're going like, to an Oktoberfest. <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> well, listen, listen, listen. We have to appeal to the states as well as Europe. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> For the little metaphor cast. For the little metaphor cast. If you're going to <laughs> Oktoberfest, what Pokemon and or trainer, as long as they're above drinking age, are you bringing with you as your plus one? Zach, we're going to start you off. Uh, I that's that's a <laughs> which so you're saying which Pokemon and trainer Pokemon or am trainer, I bringing or trainer? Okay, so first and foremost, I think I'm gonna bring it back old school because I am old, sure. and we're gonna go with uh, the Team Rocket trio um, sure. with uh, with uh, Jesse and James because I feel like they're just like 
way too underrated. I bet those people would be a hoot at any kind of drinking, any kind of social gathering. Perfect. And I love how I have these things set up with my yeah. iPhone camera that it just does like <laughs> random things, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is crazy. That's perfect. I should know all these for next time. Um, yeah, I bet Meowth is probably going to be lit off the sure. off the Oktoberfest. Um, I'm also down for Wobbuffet to pop up there too. That's also pretty Solid. cool. Solid. Um, so that, that's the group that I'm going to go with, but like I don't know, Jesse and James, I think they'd be they'd be fire at any kind of social gathering. Perfect, perfect. Christian, who or what are you bringing with you to Oktoberfest? There's a lot there's a lot of uh, of good choices here. I have I have two off the top of my head. Sure. Uh, of course, we got to we got to get the Reggies, right? Oh. Preferably all six of them, <laughs> right? If I had to pick, I'd go with Gigas <laughs> just cuz he's the biggest. The biggest Gigas. Probably handle the most. Uh <laughs> Um, I think choice. that'd be fun, yeah. right? Uh, but you know, my um, my inner brokey uh, says, "What if we brought Goldengo?" Yeah, because October Oktoberfest is expensive. Yeah, that's, that's just true. how it is. That's true, right? I think it'd be a lot less expensive if you have Goldengo with you. That's true. That's very maybe, yeah, you can maybe eat, some... you can eat the homie afterwards too, because bro <laughs> looks delicious. <laughs> I'm sure it's made of metal, but you could try. It looks like you could, you Give could me a try. couple of drinks. I will try. <laughs> All right, Arnie. I'd love to see that. Arnie, who or what are you? What Pokemon or and or trainer are you bringing with you to Oktoberfest? All right, so I think I gotta go with my favorite Pokemon of all time, Dragonite. I would oh, love to be flying. Yes. I see you have the Dragonite plush out there. It's Doug, amazing. It's amazing. I do you. also have a little one out there. I have many. I have many. Uh, yeah. Here. Mm. Amazing, amazing. So I would love to be flying out to the Oktoberfest with my Dragonite. So like, you know, you can save on some travel expenses when you're traveling with a Dragonite. You That's don't right. have to book an airplane ticket. Go some and also like Dragonite is just like a, such a big boy. So like, if something goes wrong, I always have the Dragonite with me. So That's right. everything's going to be all good. And if I would have to pick something else as well, we could... Me, me VMAX was a pretty good deck. So uh. I would have to go with the me, me as well and bring some Genesis as well. And we're going to have a party. Perfect, perfect. All right, everybody, this is the time we're going to give you your platform to do your shout outs and let people know where they can find you online. So, Arnie, we'll start off with you here. Any shout outs you want to give and uh, where people can find you? Yeah, just shout out to you guys for uh, having me on here. It was a pleasure to be in here. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm Mr. Sharni. You can go <laughs> look it up out there. And also, like, thank you guys for watching watching this video. Absolutely. And Christian, as always, great to have you on here. But where are you going to give your shout outs this time? And where can people find you? Yeah, so um, uh, Sticks PTG on every platform that I'm on, uh, namely uh, X and uh Twitch, uh, stream on Twitch, of course, mentioned that earlier. Uh, shoot me a follow. I mainly stream European time zones, but if you're up early in the morning in the States, uh, I'm typically live in the weekdays. So uh, greatly appreciate if you stop by there. Um, maybe a little less child friendly. I'm not known to mince words, but um, if that's not an issue for you, stop by. It's a good time. Um, again, follow me on Twitter, X, whatever. Uh, it's kind of where anything uh, affiliated with me will be. Uh, posted um and otherwise shout out to i guess if i'm if i'm on the tss podcast i kind of have to shout out kitchen right uh <laughs> i feel to. like it's that's how that you. works <laughs> i'll have to uh but i think i will Got just because it. it's funnier that way sure. um <laughs> so shout out to kitchen uh and of course thanks for having me on it's always uh it's always a pleasure it's always a good time awesome, uh, awesome. yeah appreciate it and Zach, we're going to skip right over your... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, no. Zach, what shout-outs do you want to give and where can the people find you? Uh, Shout-out to everyone for kind of hanging out today. It's uh, cool to hang out with uh, people that I don't always get a chance to talk to. So um, Arnie and uh, Christian, it's been cool chatting with all y'all. And thank you, PJ, for setting this up for this little daytime play date for us and yeah. daytime play, play date for y'all. Um, now i got to think about which Pokemon I want to bring to social <laughs> gatherings going forward. So thank you for ruining my life um You're welcome. other than that no i'm just uh I i'm preparing for uh the latin american international championship so if anyone's trying to prepare for that or any upcoming events hit me up for on metify other than that you could find me on social media at uh zach lesage or zach lesage ptcg on almost all platforms um 
beyond that, I've just been like looking up on the side browser here on how to trigger all the different uh, FaceTime gestures. So I'm gonna, I, we're gonna see if the Rock On works to shoot out lasers. Fair. Fair. Oh, oh yeah! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> shout out, shout out to Apple. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Apple for like all these cool things that I can do on videos now. We got them. Yep. Uh, so uh, gotta love it. Uh, appreciate all y'all. Got the fireworks, got the laser show going, Fair. and uh, I'm gonna eat some lunch. That's the that's the oh, way. That's right the now. play. That's the play. Well, thank that's you all play. so much for watching this video here on the Shuffle Squad. If you want to find more Shuffle Squad, make sure that you're not only subscribing to the channel, you can leave this video a like if you want more like this. But you can also find us on TikTok and Instagram as well as Metify. We opened up a group for Metify where you can see all of our deck lists and get awesome articles from all of our pro players over there. So definitely want to check that out but as always shout out to all of our sponsors here for shuffle you can check them out in the description of the video kayfabe cards over in utah can get you the cards that you need ptcglstore.com can get you the codes you need to play the games online you can play the late night tournament every wednesday for both eu and na and you're going to want to check out all the cast here on the stream but shout out to you for watching that's who we really care about here so thank you so much for watching the video all the way through we're going to hop right over to our sponsors but you can catch us next time here on the shuffle squad Want to support the Shuffle Squad? Be sure to check out all of our sponsors in the description to pick up Pokemon TCG singles, sealed, and PTCG live codes. You made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching this entire video from the Shuffle Squad. Honestly, from the bottom of our hearts, we appreciate each and every person that supports our content watches what we have going on every single day every single week even from time to time and uh, continuously allows us to have a forum to project our creative content towards the pokemon tcg community so if you haven't already be sure to give this video a like subscribe to the channel and even leave a comment to help boost the youtube algorithm that being said we'll catch you with our next video thanks again take it easy